Uh, these last few weeks, we have been on a journey through the book of Ruth, uh, doing a deep dive in this incredible story where we've unpacked and really learned what it looks like to grieve. Not just to, to go around and avoid the grief in our life, but to actually go through it, to sit in it, to see what God has for us in it. And in that, we have found actual, genuine, real practical hope in the midst of this really difficult story. Uh, we've seen and we've learned and discovered that the book of Ruth is so much more, so much deeper than we may have thought or even been taught in times past. I, I actually heard uh, from someone over these past few weeks that, you know, I always thought, and uh, the book of Ruth was always taught in a way that, uh, that said the main point of the book of Ruth is that Christian women in Christian circles ought to wait patiently for their Boaz, or that the book of Ruth is some story about how uh, we should find our wholeness in marriage, but that's actually not what the book of Ruth is about at all. It's not a story about how women can find wholeness in a husband. It's not a story about how single people can find wholeness in marriage, it's not, uh, the book of Ruth isn't about how Ruth found her Romeo. The book of Ruth is in fact about humanity needing a redeemer. And as we've spent some time in this book throughout the last few weeks, we've discovered that the book of Ruth is so much more than just a story about waiting for your best life through marriage. And so if this story from this book has been used as a bat to bludgeon you in times past as opposed to a, a balm to comfort and convict you. But I wanna invite you, I wanna challenge you to lean in this morning because God's word and, and God himself are so much better than anything that you may have been taught or thought from times past. Now, I'm not talking about conviction. I'm not saying that, uh, that the things that God instructs or prohibits in, in Scripture, like if we don't like them, then we can just kind of pick and pull and choose and take things out of context and make them say something that Scripture doesn't. No, conviction and sanctification are, are holy and purifying and good. Weaponizing Scripture against people is not good. And so as we wrap up our journey this morning, uh, we're, we're gonna do a quick flyover uh, through the book of Ruth and all of the territory that we've covered. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, oh gosh, I've missed the last three weeks and now I'm here for the very last week. What do I do to catch up? We're gonna do a flyover, but not in like a, a kind of like a, a prop flyover and where you're in a little two-seater airplane. Think like fighter jet because we are gonna blast through these last few weeks. In chapter one, uh, we were introduced to two women who basically lost everything. Naomi had a husband and two sons, and they were from the little town of Bethlehem. Uh, but before it went all big time with a Christmas song, they were in Bethlehem in the midst of and in the, the season in history of great trials and difficulty. They were in Bethlehem during a famine in this horrible time in history, a time that scripture says was when the judges ruled, a time of death and injustice and moral depravity at its finest. And they were just in this, this cyclical lifestyle of going through dysfunction, going through difficulty, crying out to God, God redeeming them, God changing circumstances for them, and then they would just go back to doing the same old thing on and on and on. In this famine, these two women left Bethlehem and went to the neighboring land of Moab. Moab, the ultimate unfriendly neighbor. Not in a, not in a sense of uh, get off of my lawn kind of unfriendly neighbor, but think like biggest rival kind of neighbor. They get to Moab and Naomi's sons marry two Moabite women, which is problematic for the people of God because in that day, they weren't even supposed to associate with the Moabites to the 10th generation because of their infidelity and incest, just the disgusting nature of their sin. But don't get stuck worried about their 
sons marrying Moabite women because all of the men eventually die, leaving Naomi with her two daughters-in-law. And Naomi says, hey, I'm gonna head back to Bethlehem. I'm gonna head back to my hometown. You girls should stay back in your country of Moab. And so Orpah, one of her daughters-in-law, says, yeah, I'm gonna head back. I'm gonna try to reconnect with a guy that I met in high school. I think we're Facebook friends. I think we can probably try to rekindle this thing. And Ruth makes that famous statement in the moment where she says, Naomi, wherever you go, I'll go. Your home will be my home. Your people, my people. Your God will be my God. And so what must it have been about Naomi's devotion to God that attracted Ruth to leave her home, to leave everything that was comfortable to her. What must it have been about Naomi's faith in God that prompted Ruth to look at her and say, I'm coming with you? For you and I today, who's, who's watching our life and saying, because of his devotion to Jesus, because of her devotion to Jesus, I wanna abandon all of this other stuff that hasn't served me well and go after what he's going after, what, what she's pursuing in her life because your life is so compelling. Chapter one ends with this cliffhanger of hope because they get back to Bethlehem right in the midst of the harvest season. Chapter two is this new beginning. Chapter two is the beginnings of hope for Ruth and Naomi as they've gotten back to Bethlehem at the beginning of harvest, which is good news for them because these are two women who have lost everything. They have no men, which means they have no way to provide for themselves. They have no protection for themselves. And so they go back to Bethlehem to this place where Naomi's God, the God of heaven and earth, has made a provision for people in need called gleaning. Uh, this was essentially the system of caring for and providing for those in need. It wasn't a career path. It wasn't like, hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a gleaner. No, it wasn't anything like that because with gleaning would have come shame and poverty. But these women were at the end of their rope. Nothing to lose. So in order to live, in order to survive, and in order to, to eat, Ruth did this back-breaking just debilitating work of gathering up the leftovers that all of the more well-off had left behind. Matthew Henry, the great theologian and Bible commentator says this, when Providence made Ruth poor, she didn't say, I'm ashamed to pick up the leftovers, which was like begging. No, she didn't tell her mother-in-law she was never brought up to live on crumbs, even though she wasn't brought up to do such a thing. No, Ruth was brought down to it and she's not uncomfortable with it. I think we gotta ask ourselves in, in this story, how's my humility when I'm in circumstances that I don't like? Am I willing to do what's in front of me even though it's the thing that I never expected having to do? Am I willing in humility to just take the next right step? What I love about Ruth, what I love about this story is that even when she learns in chapter two who Boaz is, she's not like, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. And then like, peace out, I'm out here. I got my provision, I'm out, I don't need anything else. I met Boaz, I'm done here. No, she just continued in the humble work before her. Just trusting that she was in the right field and that God would provide at just the right time. But maybe you're thinking or you've thought at some point in your life that you're just in the wrong field, but yet God is saying to you today, just keep doing the humble work. I didn't get my fields confused. We have a part to play in our provision. We just have to continue to take the next single right step that's ahead of us. Chapter three is a turning point after we are left on that cliffhanger of hope. Chapter three is when things start to get rolling because Naomi is like, it's time for me to play matchmaker. And so she goes to Ruth and says, okay, Ruth, it's time to get dressed. Uh, not like uh, pull off the jeans that you threw over the chair, kind of get dressed. No, go in the back of the closet and spray on a little bit of perfume, wax your eyebrows a little bit. This is, this is game time. It's threshing floor time for you, Ruth. And so that's exactly what Ruth does. This was probably the very first time that Ruth had taken off her widow's garments. 
And this wasn't a, a moment for Ruth to say, okay, it's done. I'm done grieving. I'm over that. This is a new season. No, this wasn't a moment where Ruth was moving on. It was a moment for Ruth to begin to move forward. Likely a very painful time for Ruth. And there are times that in our obedience to what God calls us to do, there are times where that's incredibly painful. But what we gotta realize is that following Jesus doesn't just involve the easy living fairy tale with a bow on it and everyone lives happily ever after. No, sometimes it's incredibly difficult to take that step that God's called us to take. That's exactly what Ruth does. She goes down, she proposes. Boaz says, hey, there's actually a relative that's closer than I am in relationship to him, to you, but if he doesn't do it, I will. And then we get to the end of chapter three with this great cliffhanger of hope, and this is how chapter three wraps up. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle this matter today. We're gonna settle this matter today at the, at the city gates, at the epicenter of life and everything that happens in the city. So Ruth chapter four, verse one says this. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, and sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now notice that we don't have this closer relative's first name. Notice that, that of all of the things that has, have stood out in this book of Ruth, throughout the entire story of Ruth, all of the names play such a vital role in the, in the narrative of Ruth. And yet, this guy's name, this redeemer's name, is left out. Actually, in the ancient Hebrew text, uh, the narrator uses this indefinite phrase that's essentially like you and I saying, Mr. So-and-so, for this redeemer. All of the other names in the story uh, were named to connect to the person's character. It's almost as if this person has no character. Verse two, and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, but in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people, if you'll redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me so that I may know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it, and I will come after you. And Mr. No Name said, I'll redeem it. Boaz here in this moment is making his case with a quorum of people. There are witnesses all around. And so Boaz is holding himself and the rest of the community the highest standard of the law here in this conversation with Mr. No Name and saying, hey, Naomi is selling this plot of land. Do you wanna buy it? So Mr. No Name is like, well, this sounds like an offer I can't refuse. I've been wanting to build up the real estate portfolio. I've always thought about hosting an Airbnb. This is the moment to capitalize on my gains here. And so not only will I bring all of my wealth, I'll take all of Elimelech's wealth too, and I will do it right now. Yes, I'll take this. So Boaz says, great, done, sold, deal. But you just need to know that according to the law, you get the land and you get Ruth, the Moabite. This is when things change for Mr. No Name because at that point when he realizes he's not just getting the land, he's getting Ruth too, he's like, whoa, hang on a minute. Nope, I'm out. I don't want anything to do with that. Verse six, then the redeemer said, I can't redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself for I can't redeem it. You know what, I'll pass. On second thought, I don't think I want the land Anyway, I've never really wanted to invest as much in this. Boaz, it it seems, knows that this guy's character is so motivated just by what he can get. And so in front of God and everyone, Boaz gets Mr. No Name to say, yeah, I'll take it. And then, ah, you know what, on second thought, I'll pass. All of this takes place in the presence of witnesses. Because now, 
Mr. No Name can't come back after the fact and say, hey, nobody ever told me that this was on the market. Mr. No Name can't come back and say, hey, if I would have only known that I would have taken this. No, Boaz does all of this above board. And like you do in modern contracts and transactions, when they're sealed and signed and done, we swap shoes. That's what they did here. And they finished. It's the ancient equivalent of a notary public. But think about where this transaction happened. Think about where this redemption happened. It happened at the city gates of Bethlehem. We know, spoiler alert, this little town of Bethlehem played a a critical, a huge role in the life of God's people, but also in the life of the Messiah, Jesus himself. In Micah chapter five, if you flip over there, uh, you can see this promise that talks about the city of Bethlehem. If you can't flip over there in time, no worries, it's gonna be on the screen behind me. But it says this, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. Uh, This insignificant, too little, uh, really not a big deal city of Bethlehem. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. This is a prophecy foretelling that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But before all of that, Before Jesus was born, there's this, at the city gates of Bethlehem, there's this transaction that took place that's arguably the most important transaction to happen in this city. Because Boaz and Ruth, in their getting together, God saw fit to give Ruth a son, and from that son would not only come the King David, but Jesus the Messiah who was promised. Every detail of this story has been meticulously orchestrated by a sovereign God who is always, always, always working. If you look back in your own life, can you see all of the ways that God has intentionally and sovereignly orchestrated every detail of your life to bring you to where you're at now? I mean, if it weren't for all of the things that God had done ahead of today, can you see that God is always, always, always working in your life? You know what's interesting is chapter three wrapped up this phrase that stands out, but he will settle the matter today. You know what Ruth and Naomi didn't do? They didn't work. They didn't work for it. They didn't, they didn't help. They didn't try to like lend a helping hand. They didn't state their case or fight for their rights. They didn't do any of that because God settled it for them. And if God said he's gonna settle it, he will settle it and he can settle it even if we're not there. Naomi didn't say, uh, hey God, look, uh, thanks for bringing me to the place that I'm at now, but I can take it from here. Uh, Naomi didn't step up in the moment and say, hey God, thanks for what you've done, but like I've got a better idea now that it's at this point in the relationship, I've got a better idea. No, none of that happened because God did it. And this is what God did in in verse 11. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman, Ruth, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. Uh, Translation, may the Lord make Ruth a nation builder. What a huge blessing to speak over this poor immigrant widow who just a day earlier was gleaning in the field. And, And let me just tell you, there is abundant blessing. There is abundant power in spoken blessing. It's great to pray. It's great to pray for people and with people. Please continue to do that. But I'm just telling you, there's incredible power in spoken blessing. Don't you remember every life-giving word ever spoken over you? The problem is every one of those life-giving words is probably in conflict with the hundreds and hundreds of life-sucking words also spoken about you. But as believers in Jesus... We have this opportunity to be arsenals of truth builders over people. 
I said it a couple of weeks ago, but it is a tra- I said it a couple of weeks ago that it is a tragedy to wait until the end of someone's life, after their life, when they are dead and gone, to speak words of life over them. We've got to be encouragers as, as people of Jesus. We've got to speak life and blessing. And so parents, bless your children and encourage them no matter what age they are. Children, bless and encourage your parents no matter what age they are. Husbands, bless and encourage and speak life into your wife no matter how much you feel like that's not a gift of yours. Wives, Speak blessing and encouragement over your husbands, no matter how much they do or don't deserve it. Friends, let's build arsenals of truth over people. Bless them, combat the lies of the enemy and the accuser of our soul with arsenals of truth. And then watch God's plan play out. Watch how it happens in Ruth's story. In verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. This messianic promised one, this rescuer, his line is beautifully preserved. Which tells me and tells you today that God's plan is always preserved. Listen, there is nothing you can do or not do that's going to hijack God's plan for your life. There is no scenario, no situation, no sin that you can find yourself in that will stump God to where he says, huh, I don't know how to deal with that one. There's nothing you've done that nobody else knows but God, that God can't bring beauty from ashes in your life. It's who he is and it's what he does. And here's why all of this matters in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth matters because it illustrates exactly what has happened for all of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is that God, in his abundant and overflowing mercy for you, for me, sent his son Jesus for our redemption. Through his death on the cross, as a payment for our sin, we are no longer doomed, which means that We were far off and now we're brought near. We were beggars gleaning for leftovers and now we're royalty. We were foreigners and exiles just like Ruth and now we have been grafted into the family of God himself. We had every reason for fear and now we are lavished in unmerited favor. We were empty like Naomi and now we have been filled by God himself. We were dead and now We are alive by the blood of Jesus. Why? Because God's plan is always preserved. If you don't know Jesus today, if you found yourself here at at Mountain View and you're wondering, like, why are these people so hype? Why are they so excited? Well, it's because we believe that Jesus has changed us. We believe that Jesus is the answer for everything, that Jesus is the solution for everything wrong in our world that he's the reason we lift our hands and sing because we can't help but be overwhelmed by the overflow of a grateful soul. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see, not because of anything good in me, not because of the, 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 the overwhelming religious resume that I've put together, but thank God it's because of the mercy and the masterful redemption of Jesus. See, the book of Ruth shows us a human representation of every one of us in the room who are believers in Jesus that we've grabbed hold of. Now, if you don't know what it means for Jesus to be the answer for your soul, we'd love to have a conversation with you. Love to chat with you after service. We don't just get together once a week on Sundays because we heard that there are some empty chairs in a room. Now, we gather every single week, good weeks and bad weeks, easy celebration weeks and excruciatingly difficult weeks. We gather once a week because it bolsters our faith to be in community, to gather together and tell the greatest story ever written and to hear things from his word and to ask his spirit to change us and conform us so that we become more and more like Jesus until the day that we see him face to face. The story of Ruth is ultimately a story of hope. 
it's a story of the hope of Jesus as a redeemer. It's not just a story of hope in history. It's a story of hope for our story. It's not just a good for them story. It's a good for us story because Jesus is the answer to hopelessness. Not because you have to walk through life in ways that you'll avoid all of the difficult circumstances. It's not because you won't have to walk through hard things or ever experience grief or loss or pain or ever get angry or upset. No, it's a story of hope that in spite of all of those things, there's a day coming where we get to be forever with Jesus, where every tear will be dried, where every pain will be solved. There will be no more death, no more fear, no more hopelessness because we will look at hope in the eyes of Jesus. We know him. Jesus has changed everything about us, and we want to introduce you to him. It's why we're here. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus today, I don't want you to forget that there's hope for whatever's in front of you today. You are not hopeless when Jesus is on the scene. But may we not be people who come in and out every Sunday, and nothing's different. May we, may we be a people who spend time being with Jesus so that we become more like Jesus for the sake and for the good of others. May we be people of hope, not just as an emotion that we feel, but the active conviction that despair will not have the final word in our life. Let's pray. Father, we're, we're grateful for the truth of your word that reminds us that that there's hope, that reminds us that even in pain, even in difficulty, even in extremely hard seasons, that, that you're there, that you're present, that you're working. And so this morning, God, would you, would you just remind us that when you're present and with us in our life, despair doesn't have the final word. God, we're grateful that your plan is always preserved in our life. Even through the, the, the circumstances we walk through and the silliness that we bring in our own life because of our choices. God, would you, would you do what only you can do in our life, in our families, and in this community? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.